Hey, I'm John. Thanks for joining me for this video today. In this video, I'm going to continue building Citadel's Adeptus Mechanicus Archaeopter. In the last video, I got the cockpit painted and the whole model assembled and primed, so it's ready for painting. My goal in this video is to get all of the base paint down, which is going to be, there's actually quite a few colors that go on here, and I'm going to be doing it all uh, with acrylics and all with brush painting. Now, if you've not built uh, a Citadel kit before, uh, one thing to note is they don't give you precise painting instructions like you would get uh, for example, uh, you know, I for many years I built aircraft, and most aircraft models will tell you exactly paint this, this color, and this, this color, and this, this color. Very precise. Um, Citadel is a little looser with their painting instructions, but I think if you understand the logic behind it, uh, it it'll make it a little easier. You see on here the colors it's supposed to be. If you go to the interior of the instructions, you have these, these directions here on painting some of the model. But what they tend to do, the way Citadel works, is their system is you put down a base coat, and then a shade, and then a layer paint over it, and then an edge highlight. And so anytime they call out colors, they, they always tend to assume that you're going to know okay you use this system and they actually have an app that will help you pick out these colors and they'll have you uh, they have places on their website that you can pick them out so when you're looking at this really if you just know the base color of anything like if you know okay that the basic part of this red is corn red the basic part of these this this area between these metal parts here is a bad and black um, this part here is Lead Belcher. This is Balthazar Gold. This underneath is Morgast Bone. If you know what the base colors are, and when you're looking at it, you can generally tell, then you know what additional colors to use. And in a lot of cases, it's just left up to whoever's painting it to decide what they want. And you don't have to go canon. I'm going to go canon with this. Uh, but you don't have to do that. You can you can take it in whatever direction you want. So if you're looking at it and you say, well, there's not a whole lot of painting instructions, um, they just provide you with a few pictures on the inside and the box art. And from that, if you understand the system, then you'll be able to paint everything on the box. And you just look around for placement. And they give you some good photos. Between this on the instructions and the back of the box, the back of the box shows a lot of detail and it it even shows you different areas okay you're going to use these colors here you know it shows you some of these for the whole you're going to use this but it just give you gives you some details that you can look at and once you take this uh, kind of as a as a full picture of how it's supposed to look the painting becomes apparent but it's just not done in a way that, that I guess you'd say traditional uh, model kits uh, often do that. One other note, if, if, you're, if you're brush painting this like I'm going to be doing, if, if you're brush painting, you may be already be completely familiar with brush painting, and so you don't even need to hear this. But if you're new to brush painting and you're trying to do this um, with a brush, not an airbrush, you can certainly do it with an airbrush, but if you're trying to do this with a brush, the key to brush painting is thin your paints. Uh, you don't want them to be runny, but you want them to be not quite thin enough to airbrush, but you want, especially in the larger areas, do them, thin them so that, that it takes two or three coats to build up. And I'll show you how I'm going to do that here in a moment. But you want to put on two or three coats. You know, uh, for many years, Duncan Rhodes was on Warhammer TV uh, on YouTube and he was famous for he's known as two thin coats because he would constantly uh, reiterate that point multiple thin coats two thin coats three thin coats 
that will build up the color and it will give you smoother paint. You're not going to be able to get it necessarily as smooth as you would with an airbrush, but it's going to be much smoother if you thin your paints, put them on in layers, let a layer completely dry, and then go over the top with another layer. If you go in too soon, the, the, the paint underneath, if it's not dry yet, will actually tear a little bit and almost come off like skin from an onion or something like that. So multiple thin coats and also think about the order of the colors that you're going to be doing it. Like the way I'm going to work this is I'm going to start off doing the undersides with this lighter tan color, this more gassed foam, and then I'll do the red coloring so that the red will easily cover up any of that more gassed bone that I need to cover up where I haven't been quite as neat with that. And uh, that'll be the next color. And then the final main color that I'll put on will be the black because that will cover up any of the other two easily. And then I can go in with the lead belcher and the Balthazar gold and just carefully paint in the various details around the model and that'll get the base painting done. So think about your multiple thin coats and what is your painting strategy to make sure that it's easy to just kind of layer these up and not have to fight trying to put a lighter color over a darker color. All right, the first color I'm going to use is this Morgast Bone. And I've already stirred this up. I, I, know, I know I see them do it all the time on Warhammer TV, but I don't recommend shaking these paints because if you've ever had paint get clogged up around the lid and here on the back and they dry out and it just creates a horrible mess. It's shaking that causes that. If you get you one of these little stir tools like this, this one's from Badger but there's a lot of companies that make them, and stir your paints with this, one, they're going to be mixed much more thoroughly. But two, you don't get all that mess up around the opening and your, your paints are going to last longer your, your bottle is not going to be as clogged up and it'll just work out better all around in my experience. But I'm going to get some of this paint on my palette. Now you can use a wet palette certainly. I have one and I occasionally use it. Um, but for this kind of large bulk painting I like to just get a little bit of paint on my palette here and just work directly from this. Now to this, I'm going to add just a little bit of airbrush flow improver. You can use water. I like this. Um, it's not quite 50-50 mix, but it's close. And then I add a single drop of this. This is Liquitex Flow Aid that I've decanted a little bit into this little bottle. And I add just a single drop of it. And this is different from flow improver. This stuff, I don't know what's in it but it literally makes it flow off the brush much better. You don't want to use too much of this because it can, uh, it can do, uh, it can too, in, in too much of it in there will make it hard to paint. But I just take all of that and I mix it up like this. And then I just look at it and I just see how does that flow? Am I getting a little bit of flow? And I think I want just one more drop of airbrush flow improver. Thinning paints for brush painting is kind of like thinning them for the airbrush. There is no perfect ratio uh, for doing so because every paint's pigments are a little different and every paint manufacturer's paint is a little different. And so you just have to see how does that work. You know, I like the way that feels. And it's odd. You can actually feel, or I can, I don't know, um, if it's just something I'm perceiving that's not real, but I can feel how that stirs, how it feels on the brush. Now I'm going to offload most of that because my brush is really loaded up. I've got a little piece of paper towel here off to the side and I'm going to offload most of that because I've got a really loaded brush now. And I'm simply going to go back into it, get some on the tip, get that off, and then I'm just going to apply that to the underside. Now I like to apply it in a vectored kind of approach like that. And you see that's not covering really well. That's okay. I, I don't want to try and just blast it on there. I want to get just basic coverage over this part that needs to be this Morgast bone. Okay, I've got the Morgast bone on. It took 
uh, I'd call it two and a half coats, um, and they're not perfect. I, I will I will admit I'm uh, painting large areas like this with a brush is still a bit of a struggle for me. So that's why I weathered the heck out of them. <laughs> but but I got it on, like I said, two and a half coats. And what I want to do now is a little bit of, well, not a little bit, quite a bit of dry brushing to, uh, to not only bring out some of the details, but to just add a bit of, I guess you'd say, fading to uh, parts of the model to, to make the surface look a little bit varied. And the reason I'm doing this now, uh, I don't want to, I want to get all of this done before I start working on the red. And, and so it's easiest just to do it now rather than waiting for all of the base colors to be laid in. So what I'm going to use for that is some of this Ushabti bone. And uh, it's one of my favorite paint colors to say, Ushabti bone. Ush you can't help but say it without a slight, you know, even though it's not a great, I, I don't do a good job of it, a slight British accent. Ooh, shabti bone. I mean, it, just, it, just, it just rolls off the tongue, though. Anyway, let me get this set up, and I'll do some dry brushing. And right, I've got my paint thoroughly mixed, and I'm just going to go straight into the pot and get some of this on the end of the brush. And I'm using this big, fluffy makeup brush, and I'm going to work off a good bit of that paint. Now, I'm not going for just a highlight dry brushing, but I'm going to go over the whole surface a bit a bit harder than I would on just a, a general dry brush because I want to lighten the tone of it up just a little bit in some areas and start bringing out some of those details. I'm going to go back and do a second dry brush with a lighter color, but this will just kind of blotch it up a bit and uh, make it look like a used military thing. Next I'm going to use some Citadel Screaming Skull and I'm going to do the same kind of thing but this time I'm going to use a little more focused approach on the dry brushing because what I want to do here is provide just a little bit of an edge highlight. So I'm going to get more of the paint off of the brush than I did before and I've switched to this flat brush and I'm essentially just going to go in and really try and hit just the edges of things to give them a little bit of edge highlighting. It won't be as distinct now, but later on when I add in some shade, um, uh, some shades to bring out to, to help with the depths and the shadows, the contrast will be a little more apparent. All right, with the tan color applied to the underside, it's time to do the corn red on the top. And there's a few places where you're gonna have to paint in demarcation lines. And what I'm doing for those is I've got some of the corn red in my palette and it's only thinned just a little. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these rivets here as my kind of anchor point for the line and I'm just going to paint them across like that hoping my hand doesn't shake too bad. I could mask this but I'd rather just paint it because I'm okay if it's not perfect. But I just want to get a generally consistent line. And what I'm doing is I'm painting a little bit away from where I want the line to be so that I can get it basically in there and then go fill in the rest. But you see, I just paint that in like that. And then I'll go back and just slowly start filling it in to give me a little bit of margin for error, so to speak. And I'll bring it up the side about, oh, that much. Just so that when I go in with the big brush to paint the rest of it, I won't have any problems. Well, I hope I won't. But some of the areas are going to be easier to paint, like um, this here, the line is pretty much already there, so I just got to be careful about bringing my strokes down that way and not letting the paint run over. Um, these up here will be fairly easy. They're the same way. And then there'll be the leading edges of the wings, which I need to do. But you can mask it off. You could paint a wavy line. I've seen people that will paint a line that's close and then use a sponge to kind of stipple in some of the color so that it looks like there's a bit of a fade or a gradient between the two. Um, you have to be kind of careful with that, but it looks cool if you can if you can knock it out. 
so that's that's how I'm going to do the demarcation here, just to save a little time. Now I'll go back in um, with a little bit of either the corn red or the morgast bone, which depending on which is needed, and just do just a tiny bit of cleanup if I don't like any of those areas. But another thing to keep in mind when you're painting a line like this, if you have an area that's not quite perfect, that's a great place for where to put a chip later on, and it'll completely hide that. All right, well, I'm going to get the rest of the red painted, and I'm going to do it exactly like I did the underside. I'm going to paint the base, and then I'm going to go in, and I'm going to do some lighter work with Mephiston red, and then some, uh, then some highlight work, and I'll show a little bit of each of those steps, but got a lot of red to paint now. All right, I have the corn red applied across the model, and, and uh, that took a little while, but uh, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. It's fairly smooth. It's not airbrush smooth, but it's it's good enough for government work, I suppose you could say. The next thing I want to do is I want to add a little bit of a, a, a shaded look, or rather a faded look, to kind of break apart these patches of, of this solid red color. And for that, I'm going to use Mephiston Red. Now I'll do this like I did on the underside. I'll get some of this paint, this Mephiston Red, on my, my big fluffy brush. Now I thinned the paint just a little, and I mean maybe one drop of just water to four parts, one part water to four parts paint. I don't want it quite as thick as it comes out of the pot, but I definitely want the, uh, the, the paint to be a little bit thin so that it doesn't leave too much of a texture. If you put thick paint on in the method that I'm going to be doing, it, it will leave a little bit of a texture. And if a texture is what you're going for, then that's fine. But I don't want it to be too textured. I'm not going to be too upset if there's a little bit of it, but I don't want there to be too much of it. So after I unload most of that paint, all I'm going to do is just kind of start going in and pouncing that on there and maybe rubbing it in. And the idea is just going to be to give uh, a, an effect kind of like you would with post shading on a model if you were using your airbrush. You see how that's just bringing in a little bit of color variation right there on that panel and it's just slight. And the more I put on there, the more it's going to build it up because it's going to add more paint. But I'm just going to go around and on these open areas, I'm just going to put this in like that. And you can also do some dry brushing uh, of some areas that maybe you can't get as much of it with the, the pounce method, um, if you want to call it that. But I'll just go across the model and do this and just introduce some of that color variation and then I'll come back and do something one more round of uh, highlights to really bring them out. Alright with the Mephiston Red on I'm going to switch to Evil Sun Scarlet which is a little bit brighter and I'm going to do some more dry brushing but this dry brushing is going to be more focused. I'm going to switch to a, a proper dry brush I guess you'd say and I'm going to be focusing mostly on the edges but still doing a fairly heavy dry brush to kind of bring those areas out. All right, I've got that Evil Sun Scarlet on there. And what it does, it does several things, all of this, this dry brushing. It gives tonal variation to the surface, so it's not just this plain um, corn red on it. it, it as, as you build up to the brighter color, it suggests some Zenithal highlighting that that where there's light coming in from above, it's going to make something appear a little bit brighter. But it also just makes the paint look a bit worn. It's paint, if you've seen any military vehicle or piece of construction equipment, the paint is rarely one color. It's going to have places that are faded and patchy and a bit chipped and things like that. So doing these minor changes in color that go from a darker down low to a brighter up top. I, I made sure to focus that, that, let's say the Evil Sun Scarlet, that was focused more on the top and the edges that would be facing up. The Mephiston Red was more generally down the side, but still 
you know, I, I left a little bit of a line here around the bottom where I hadn't done any of that. So it gives some shading, some, some distressing, and it just brings out the volumes on the model. So when somebody looks at it from a foot or two away, or especially if it's on the gaming table, then the, the volumes, the, the surfaces, the raised detail, the, the shadows, the highlights, all of that is going to stand out more and just make it look a little more lifelike, a little, a little larger, and just a little more uh, impressive. It's just going to have a little more pop. So all of those things accomplish a lot. Now, if in any area, like right here, I got a little more of the Evil Sun Scarlet than I want, all I'm going to do is go back with some Mephiston Red and just stipple over that a little bit right up there at the top just to tone that down a little bit. So you can go back and forth if you don't like how it looks and just using stippling and dry brushing just kind of get those, uh, get those areas under control and you'll end up with a fairly nice gradient. All right, the final step I'm going to take in working on the red is going to be to add an edge dry brush using Wild Rider Red. Now for this, I'm going to be a little more focused. I'm still not going to worry if I get, get it out of the areas that I'm intending because it'll all work together in the end. But I'm really just wanting to hit edges, the rivet detail. Although one thing with the rivet detail, there's a lot of it on here. And sometimes dry brushing the rivet detail can get paint where you don't want it. So in those cases, just take a pointy, you know, sharp, a brush with a good tip on it and just go and hit those rivets with individual drops of paint. But I'm just going to hit these edges like this all around, whether it's the lighter color of red that I've stippled in up here, or whether it's the dark um, corn red down towards the bottom. Regardless of where it is, I'm going to hit all of the edges that I can and just give it a little bit of a, a highlight to help further bring out those details. All right, the red dry brushing is done and it's time to move on to painting the black areas. For the black areas, I'm going to use Abaddon Black and I'm going to use a fairly large brush to paint that in and I'll thin it with just a little bit of water, not too much. Now the instructions show that the black is on these areas on the upper sides, but they use the tan for this below. I don't want to do that. I want both sides to be black, so I'm going to do it that way. Now I've got my paint loaded up on my brush here and it's fairly heavy with paint right now. So what I'll do is I'll put that in and you'll see it's thin enough that it's not doing full coverage, which is what I want. But I'm going to kind of use that as my my palette on the model, I guess you'd say, to just go back to that if I need more paint and spread that out. All right, with that first coat applied, I'm going to go ahead and put on the second coat. Note that I did not try to miss hitting those those uh, little fingers, I guess you'd call them. I went ahead and painted over them. I'm going to be painting over those with lead belcher, and uh, lead belcher covers good, but it also looks really good with black underneath. I think it actually makes it look better. So I wasn't too worried if I hit those. Now, if I don't, like right here, I'm not worried about that either. Lead belcher is going to cover it all up. I'll just go on in and put in my second coat of paint, and this is going to give us much better coverage, but still give us a nice smooth finish. All right, for the next step, I'm going to take five parts of this dark reaper and one part of a bad and black and mix them together. And what I want to do is start building up a gradient from the the so that it'll basically I want to end up with it being lighter in the center here and more towards the, the trailing edge and darker around this edge here. So I'm going to start with a mix of those two colors. Now, as before, I'm going to use my dry brush and I'm just going to start hitting the middle of it like that. If it's a little patchy, that's okay because I'm going to be going over it with more colors. But I just want to start introducing some of that gradation here in the middle. All right, now I'm going to switch to 10 parts Dark Reaper and one part Abaddon Black, Abad, Abaddon, Abad, that black color. And uh, I'm going to use this brush and I'm going to start in the middle like that so that it'll unload more of the paint there and then just kind of work my way out. 
what I'm looking for is I want it to have kind of a membrane look to it. I'm not imagining this as some kind of leather or anything like that, but rather, um, I mean, Adeptus Mechanicus has all sorts of weird stuff. So I'm, I'm looking at this as being some kind of synthetic organic membrane or something like that. So that's the, the theory behind why I'm doing it this way. All right, now that I've got that on, I've got just pure Dark Reaper in my palette here, and I thinned it down uh, maybe two parts paint, one part, one part water, roughly. And what I'm going to do here, and then I got some on my brush, but I unloaded my brush quite a bit. And I'm just going to start applying that right here, focused towards the middle, like that. And just kind of streak it right back there so that I get just a subtle gradient look. And then along the aft edge, the trailing edge of it, I'm going to go in and just do a little bit of a dry brush motion right there. The paint's actually pretty wet. But I'm just going to do that motion there to help that edge stand out. All right, the paint's not even fully dry yet, but I'm liking the way that looks. Um, it's not a perfect gradient. I could have done a much better gradient with uh, an airbrush, but I think for the intent that I have, that this is some kind of membrane and that it's it's textured and it's it's uh, got, you know, I don't know. I'm just thinking bat wings or something like that, you know. Um, I think it'll work. And then when I paint these silver and get some washes on it, I think it'll really help make those stand out. And I just realized, I don't know what I was thinking, I forgot to paint these parts. I have no idea why I thought I didn't need to paint those. But anyway, got to take a minute to go back and watch my own video and remember how I did the red and paint that. <laughs> okay, I've obviously continued working, but I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm using Citadel's Lead Belcher. There are a lot of, I'll just use the term silver, um, silver details on this model. These veins in the wings, the wires, uh, these vents. There are handles here, the landing gear have it. There's some here, there's some here. Uh, I, I don't need to, you know, the usual rules apply. Thin your paints. Um, I'm using my Wargamer Regiment brush for this because I think it has a good tip that lets me get in there. What I'm having to do is paint in these silver details, like along here is a good example. Paint in these silver details, and I try to be as precise as possible, but sometimes it gets away from me a little bit. My hands, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but my hands shake a little bit. This morning is not so bad, um, but some sometimes, especially later in the day, it gets pretty bad. But the I'm okay. I've been to the doctor, <laughs> but um, there's you'll get a little silver in places that you don't intend. Part of the reason I wanted to leave these edges Abaddon black, Abaddon black, a bad one, uh, that black color, is because I'll be able to go in and edge that, just paint right up to that with uh, the Abaddon black because. If you get a little bit of black up on the silver, it's okay because I'm going to later use in the next episode, I'm going to use Nuln Oil to help define this. That's going to go up on the silver a little bit. If you get a little bit of black on the silver, it'll hide it. But it won't hide any silver on the black. So putting in just a little bit of black paint to cover up any mistakes along the silver is critical here. And then there's also areas like here on this, this wire on the wing. You've got these all these little elements that are painted red, and you can see I'm halfway, I'm part way through it. I I found it easier to just go in and paint the silver in and not worry about getting the red on or getting the silver on those red parts. And then I can go back and neaten up and paint those with red, like in here um, and along there. So the the first two or three colors, the red, the tan, the overall black, those were just kind of paint them on roughly. But once you start into the silver and you start getting into the details, it's a matter of putting some paint on and then going back and neatening up and correcting because there's a lot of little areas 
that it can just be really hard to uh, to to have precise placement every time when you're trying to do these dry brushing effects and other things like that. So look at the instructions, the photos and the instructions, look at the photos on the box to see what needs to be silver. Make up some of your own if you want. Um, and then another thing, there's going to be some parts that are painted in Balthazar Gold, which is a bronze color. Uh, these parts along here and a few others. I would recommend going ahead and painting that lead belcher so that you have a nice metallic shiny color for the Balthazar Gold to go over because lead belcher covers very well. Um, it's a base color. It covers very well. You can put it over just about any color and with a couple of coats it covers. Balthazar Gold is a little thinner. It doesn't always cover as well. So it's much easier to cover over a solid coat of lead belcher with Balthazar Gold than a mixed coat of say some splotches of red and black and lead belcher and things like that. So everything that's going to need to be metallic, paint lead belcher and then go back later and paint uh, the rest with Balthazar Gold that needs it. Another note, these little vents right here, um, they're supposed to have the center of that is, I'm going to paint them red and uh, this is another area that I just painted the lead belcher and then I'll go back in and touch that up. So anyway, that's why I'm not showing all this because it's a lot of put some paint on, touch some paint up, put some paint on, touch some paint up and just kind of going back and forth and back and forth until I get everything painted because there's there's a ton of silver detail on this model. Now, I will say I'm having loads of fun painting this. I like brush painting. So it's been a lot of fun going through this, even though I've been I've been at this about six hours now. So it, it does take a while, but it is really, really fun. This is not a cheap model, but it you just you get all the value out of it by having all of this stuff to paint. It really is a lot of fun. While I continue to work through the thousand and one little adjustments that need to be made, I didn't want to stop and talk about painting the canopy. Now, as I had mentioned uh, in the first episode of this, the reason I didn't prime this, mask it off and prime it with a spray primer is it would have showed the gray primer through the canopy framing. And the interior is painted in uh, the Morgast bone color, the underside color, the tan color. So I want the canopy on the inside to show that color. So of course I'll need to put down the, the Morgast bone first on the canopy framing and then go back over it with the corn red because of course the exterior is going to be uh, the red. Now to paint the canopy, it's fairly easy. Uh, easy, sometimes easier said than done. Of course you want to be very careful and get just on the canopy framing and luckily uh, the canopy framing on this is very well raised and pronounced. Now it is going to take two or three coats to get a good opaque covering over those clear parts. Paint doesn't want to stick to those clear parts real well. But the reason I haven't done anything to treat the canopy uh, to make it easier for the paint to stick is if I make any mistakes and get outside of the canopy framing, I'll be able to come back later with a toothpick and just scrape that away from the places where I don't want it. So I'm going to start by just carefully painting these frames with the Morgast bone and like I said give that two or three coats whatever it takes and then I'll go in with the corn red. Alright you can see that I painted the Morgast bone on and I got outside of the lines in more than a few places. I've got shaky hands and poor eyesight, but that's okay because, as I mentioned, I painted this little spot here just to demonstrate this. All I have to do is go in with a toothpick and scrape that off. And if there's any left, I can just take a brush and clean it off. So once I get the red on and I give it a little time to dry, what I'll do is I'll just sharpen this toothpick down to a very sharp point so that I can go in right at the edges at about a 45 degree angle and I'll scrape away the paint that doesn't need to be there and when I'm done it should be a nice neat canopy. So next step is to get the uh, corn red on. Alright to clean up I get my toothpick and I get a really aggressive sanding stick. This is a 180 grit and I sand my toothpick. I'm just rotating it as I scrape it across there. and I want to get it down to a nice sharp point. 
And then all I do is I go in at the edges and I just start running along the edge and it'll pull up any paint that's beyond that corner and clean it up nicely. So that's one of the, this is an old aircraft technique. Um, if guys didn't have an airbrush or weren't good at masking things off, I've seen plenty of guys, they just paint it kind of sloppy and then go back in later and clean it up. All right, you can see I've got it set in place and that looks pretty good. I'm gonna give it a little while and uh, go back and clean up. I'm already seeing some areas that I missed with the cleanup, so like right there. Um, but it gives you a good canopy. It's not quite as good as if you masked it very well and then airbrushed it, but if you're not an airbrush painter, if you just don't wanna, if you just wanna just do something simpler, this method works really well. Now, when you're cleaning it up with a toothpick, you can pull away paint from some areas that you don't want to. If you do that, don't worry about it. Just get a paintbrush, a very fine paintbrush, go back later and touch it up very precisely, and you'll be good to go. Now, what I am going to do is I'm going to need to paint in this edge here. You see where that's showing a little bit, and I'll paint that with the corn red, because it's it's not in place. It's It's just... Well, there it is. Okay, yeah, it's it's not glued in place yet, but I'll just paint that with the corn red, and uh, and that'll cover up that edge. But I'm pretty happy with that. All right, well, there's still quite a few little details I've got to go in and paint, as I talked about earlier. Just correcting where I got, you know, some of the morgast bone where it should be red, or some of the red where on the morgast bone, or let the black get a little out of line. Um, so there's a lot of little adjustments I still need to do, but there's no point in uh, in going through and videoing those or showing any of those because you get the point. Um, you get a fine tip brush and you just go around and you touch up the model. That's something I have to do on every build given the, the, the poor quality of my eyesight and the way my hands tend to uh, shake a bit, especially later in the day they, they start shaking. It's about... Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon right now so later on in the day I, I have to find other things to do generally but I'm gonna call this video done because the the bulk of the painting is done and I've, I've hopefully shown how uh, you can get these multiple colors on and in a logical order that that kind of uh, helps with the process and just some some things you can do to you know maybe give a little more depth to the the bat wings so to speak and stay true to I'm trying to stay true to the box art so uh, I feel pretty happy about where I'm at with that in the next episode I'll go through adding in uh, all the weathering the the everything from the washes to streaks and grime and and maybe a little bit of rust tones and of course chipping and all of those things will be covered in the next episode well, thank you so much for watching, especially if you if you have stuck around to this point. I am so very grateful, and uh, I hope I hope through this you've seen that this is a really really fun model kit. Um, you know, brush painting takes me back to when I was a kid. That's that's the way I did it when I was a kid. I didn't know any other way, and I just love something that gives me a good brush painting experience. And this model is just is just full of good good brushing, good brush painting experience in bucketfuls. Um, I'm not the best brush painter in the world by any means, but I'm having as much fun as I think the best brush painter would uh, doing this. So if you've never thought of building one of these, or maybe this design just looks cool to you and you're trying to decide, should I build something like this or not, I'd say give it a go because the the value of... The time spent doing it, I think, is well worth the cost of this kit. Yeah, I, I really do. Um, when you when you think in terms of the number of hours of enjoyment you get out of something, you get loads of it from this one because there's just a lot to paint. There's plenty to do, and it's fun stuff to do. None of it is hard. So I hope I hope in this video you you've seen that, and you know maybe it's gotten you excited about. If you're already building Warhammer, maybe it's gotten you excited about building more. And if you've never built it, maybe it's going to uh, make you think about looking at it and trying it yourself. But again, thank you for watching this video. 
And of course, if you haven't already subscribed, there's the button down here. You know where it's at. You know the routine. Uh, so I'd be grateful for a subscribe. There's social media links down below. So if you're on one of those, please connect with me. If you are uh, supporting me on Patreon, thank you so much for doing that. I, I'm building this kit because of Patreon. Uh, I couldn't have afforded it otherwise. And uh, the folks on Patreon make this possible, make this video possible, make the website possible. So thank you so very much. I am so very grateful for your support in this uh, as a Patreon supporter. And if you're wondering what all that's about, there's a link down below. Uh, go take a look and uh, see if one of those uh, levels of support is something you would like to do. I'd be grateful for your consideration. And finally, as I always like to do at the end of each video, I want to I want to give you one final thought. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye. Sorry about that helicopter. <laughs>